Welcome to another episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. Today, we have Felicia Phillips, founder and chairman of Phillips Consulting Limited, one of the leading and most trusted business management and consulting firms on the continent. He has over 45 years of experience in financial and cost management, industrial operations management, human capital management, information technology systems implementation, and business management consulting. He is a private sector leader with experience in consulting, advising, guiding, and mentoring organizations in the private and public sectors. He has worked with and advised the government and its many agencies at the national and state levels in his professional capacity as a management consultant. Interviewing him is Rosemont Phil Othiwa, an astute corporate and commercial attorney who has garnered experience in providing legal advisory services, tax and corporate due diligence, as well as compliance to business owners and corporate clients for almost a decade. She is an alumnus of the University of Benin. She practiced as an associate in the law firm of Olatunde, Adeju Ibe, SAN and Co. before joining the firm of Debo Akonde LLP as a partner. Rosemond is also an alumnus of our program, Justice Entrepreneurship School, JES. Join us as we listen to their journeys in entrepreneurship in the management consulting space. Hello. My name is Rosemont Phil Othiwa, corporate attorney and partner at Debo Atonde LLP, and I'm excited to welcome you once again to the podcast by Faith Foundation, The Journeys in Entrepreneurship. With me in the studio is none other but the amazing Folusha Phillips, fondly known as FOP, who is the founder and chairman of Phillips Consulting Limited. He's going to be sharing with us his breathtaking insights as well as his experience in the world of business and entrepreneurship. I'm excited to have him with us in the studio. Good day, Mr. Phillips. It's so exciting to have you with us. I think I'm more excited. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. And before this session, um, it's been incredible just hearing about the amazing work you're doing, not just in Nigeria, but in the continent as well. Um, The first thing that I would love to share with you is that we are very, very, very inspired by your work. Um, Your resilience and track record over several decades has proven to the Nigerian entrepreneur out there that there's truly hope and we definitely have mentors to look up to in the profession and in the world of business. So thank you very much for your incredible contributions in the the ecosystem. Thank you. My thanks to you. (laughs) So I would always say the greatness of a man is found in their stories and I'm sure you have them. Um, we would love to hear what your journey was like, your entrepreneurial journey into management consulting. You do so much. And to summarize decades in a minute or two may yeah. be hard, but we'd love to hear yeah. some highlights about your story and what has actually brought you to this very, very defining moment that we're in now. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yes, it's, it's it, to, to describe 30 odd years in, <laughs> in, in just a few minutes, it's a tough one. But what, what I've always said to people, and um, I think uh, it's a, a strong foundation, and it's important to note that um, when I started Philips Consulting, I was actually joining a whole generation of young entrepreneurs that were doing phenomenal things in the financial services industry, especially mm-hmm. even the, the founder of Faith Foundation, Voladiola, oh, wow. when they started GT Bank. And there's a whole generation of young people that said, okay, we are going to redefine what banking is, what financial services is. Fast track to when the telephone industry came, the GSM. There's a whole generation of young people that did phenomenal things at that time. Fast track to the digital age, a whole generation of you guys doing phenomenal things. So what I'm really saying is that what I did was I plugged in to the ecosystem of what was going on at that time. So they were starting banks, but you just don't run a bank alone. There's a whole sort of stuff that's got to be done, you know, training and recruitment and all those things. So when I set up the consulting firm, I just plugged into, wrote on the back of the phenomenal things that was happening then. So that's how it really started. Okay, that was the foundation for that. But I think uh, for me personally, what has helped to sustain us over these years was I really didn't start a consulting firm. 
I, I started an organization that I said I wanted to outlive me. Mm. And uh, there's uh, uh, Sir Akintola Williams. Some of you might not know him. He's still alive. He's about 103 years old or something. And I said, I want to be like him because he set up Akintola Williams as an accounting firm. And he left the firm and the firm carried on. And I found that so interesting. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, I want to create an organization that would outlive me, that it would be there long after I'm gone. So the mindset was different. It wasn't a case of a suitcase carrying consultant and I was doing stuff for myself. Mm -hmm. I was always about the organization and everything that I did thereafter was always about, about how to sustain the organization, how to make sure that it, it lives on and on and on. And uh, that led on to the whole concept of building an institution. And much later in life, uh, Somebody taught me a few lessons about what it means to build an institution. Mm. But what I didn't realize was that the thing that we were doing as a firm at that time mm. was how helping uh, organizations and helping people to build institutions. And if I fast forward to the lessons that I would share with a lot of you today that are doing phenomenal things, that please, you've got to learn that it's about building institutions, not just about the things that you're doing. How can we build an institution that would outlive us? Because it's the institutions that you see today that you admire so much all over the world because somebody made an effort to build that institution. And in the mentoring things that I do, I have a young nephew that's doing stuff and I've warned him and he's obeying that about building an incredible institution. I said, have the mindset if somebody wants to buy you one day, because mm. all you young people, you're selling your organizations, there's got to be something to buy. Mm. Okay, so that guided me a lot uh, in terms of the things that we did. And also the whole idea of running what I call a world-class organization. Okay, one in which, you see, world-class is forever moving. It's a moving goalpost. So you're forever improving, continuously getting better and better. So I think those are, the, those are the foundational things that I had in mind that helped us to then do all the different things, whether it was banking or training or strategy or technology or whatever it is. All those are just activities within a particular foundation. And it's that foundation that I think uh, I would like uh, to stress for a lot of people today to, to pay attention to. You can do wonderful things, make phenomenal shoes, do wonderful things in agriculture, etc. Those are activities, but they've got to be activities that can be sustainable over time. Okay. So that for me is a summary of 30 years, <laughs> uh, literally. Okay. That's incredible. Thank you so much. And I caught something from what you shared. You talked about the fact, think transgenerationally. Yeah. And I can only imagine at that time, it was quite a long time ago, I would say 30 years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You must have been an outlier, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the context of every other person, because, you know, maybe people were trying to get into different organizations, but you stood out and you were, we're going to bring structure and systems. Mm -hmm. Did you at any point feel alone in that endeavor? Um, and how were you able to face some of the unique challenges? At that time, there was no technology as we know it today. Yeah. There was no communication, swift fat communication as we know it today. So yeah. how did you grapple with those cha unique challenges at that time? And how were you able to navigate even yeah. as new seasons of technological change mm. came you know, yeah. and met your organization? Yeah. And I think uh, the, the book that, that I just read, it's called um, The Fifth Discipline by mm. Peter Senge. You know, the fifth discipline by Peter Seng. It's an old book, but um, it 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 is all about creating learning organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we were a consulting firm, I thought my people, you guys, you need to be on top of your game. So you must learn and learn and learn. And I used to invest a lot of money uh, in buying books, uh, which is the equivalent of your internet today. Okay, um, and and so the starting point again was to try and see how you could build a lot of competence in the people because the service we offered was all about knowledge. And um, also, I, I managed to get into this whole concept of uh, total quality management. You guys might not know about it today, mm. but it, it was a lifesaver. It was, it was our product. Uh, not only did we sell it, we lived it. So the whole concept of building quality management, quality management systems, uh, understanding how customers think, understanding that it's all about the customer, understanding that uh, the performance of an organization or how customers see quality is based on their own expectations. And because that tied in also with the banking industry at that time, 
where you guys might not know it in those days of tally numbers, which would be strange <laughs> to you, all the digital stuff you do today. But in those days, it, it was hard work uh, trying to build a lot of efficiency into the banking system. Don't forget that was what I plugged into. Uh, if, if I had uh, set up Philips Consulting, maybe 10 years later, it would have been into uh, telephony and the GSM. And like I said, even today, Anybody that's starting a consulting practice, which is what I tell my guys now, even though I watch them at a distance, is that you got to plug into the digital world mm -hmm. because that's what's happening. So for us, it was a case of uh, an outlier, yes, uh, coming and holding on to the concept of quality, mm -hmm. which was globally acceptable. It was a, a new thing. It allowed us to get work with major global organizations. I remember mm. I was um, invited to have a chat with the guys in Mobile mm. uh, and, you know, and Mobile, they, they were into being an American company. They were into all these issues about quality systems, management systems, ISO certifications and stuff mm. like that. And uh, I remember chatting to this uh, American gentleman he was, and the attitude was, well, we've got to use a Nigerian company. What do you know? And I proudly was able to teach him a thing or two, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but that got Philips into mobile. And it was very strange that this young consulting firm with a staff strength of about 10, 15, 20 people at that time were able to do phenomenal things at mobile because mm -hmm. we were at the leading edge, at the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. You know, the concept of total quality management was new. We were at the cutting edge. It's like somebody saying, like I tell my guys now, mm -hmm. that AI, you know, I need the firm to be at the cutting edge of AI because... Uh, people understand it, but how do you use it? How do you get value from it? Okay, so it's the same concept, same theory. So going back again, so being an outlier, I managed to get a product that could, that worked well for me and that gave us a uh, sit on the board, so to speak. But then another thing for us particularly was discovering South Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a, a, that's a, a huge thing in the life of, of the firm. Um, we... Um, just by sheer coincidence, we haven't got time to tell a long story, but we went to, had, I had an opportunity to go to South Africa with a team of, uh, of mortgage bank MDs. In those days, there were tons of mortgage banks in Nigeria. And I remember arriving in uh, Johannesburg in 1993, okay, where before the independence in South Africa, and everybody being stunned at what we saw and that, you know, this South Africa that we've all been abusing. These guys seem to, at least from an infrastructure point of view, seem to be light years ahead of us. But uh, that started another journey whereby mm -hmm. we, we hooked up with them and we were able to, um, to bring the two countries together. I think if you look at it, we must have shifted about, without exaggeration, over a thousand uh, mm -hmm. managers, CEOs, you know, we're just going back and forth and back and forth. And that's why I created a kind of a brand in South Africa. We set up an office in, in South Africa. But what was more interesting was the fact that we were able to, um, it, it opened my eyes to the whole African continent itself mm -hmm. and uh, became very, very Africa focused. So I talk a lot about the African Renaissance yes. and there were so many things that we did. We would talk about leadership in Africa, about entrepreneurship in Africa mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So, you know, it's so funny how one thing just leads to another. And, and that's, that's where we are today. Wow, that's amazing. And, you know, they will always say that where there's a gap, there's an opportunity. Yeah. There was, you, you were able to spot gaps. Gaps that basically most people wouldn't see, but you saw opportunity in yeah. it and you plugged in, you know, it's best to jump into the pool, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I would love to have a follow-up question to this, which is, you have a multidisciplinary approach, which cuts across different aspects, management, like you mentioned, information management systems, IT, finance. Do you think that experience across those disciplines gave you an edge in terms of service delivery? And how were you able to translate those qualities to even people within your organization? Because you've mentioned about being able to transfer mm -hmm. and outlive yourself, right? If an organization is all tied to one person, then it's only a matter mm, of time because yeah. humans are finite, right? But when you're able to translate that skill. So two questions in one, right? The first is, would you think or would you agree that your multidisciplinary approach, you know, gave you a broader perspective in how you were able to deliver these services? And how have you been able to translate that particular skill to those within your organization to yeah. make your work better? Yeah, yeah. I mean, without a doubt, um, I studied industrial economics, okay? And... Uh, and it's funny, I, I ended up studying industrial economics because I needed, I was more of an economist, but I needed to have 
the um, in those days to get the foreign exchange to pay your fees, you have to study a subject that's not in the country. <laughs> so instead of picking economics, I chose industrial economics, and you know, I proved to my father that look, you know, this is different from economics. Therefore, mm. they should give you permission to get foreign exchange. So in studying industrial economics, it's a combination of manufacturing and industrial stuff mm. with economics and marketing and things of that nature. So that set me on a particular pathway in terms of thinking. So I wasn't thinking as an economist. I was thinking more of a, of a manufacturing type of economist. Mm. Then I studied accounting. But then again, I didn't go into a typical chartered accounting type of stuff. What I did, was I studied management accounting, cost accounting. Mm. So here you have an economist that understands industrial setup and understands costing. It was just a whole range of, uh, of integrated skills that I had. And then I went, uh, having studied accounting, <laughs> it's so funny. I, I joined, uh, in those days, it was British Gas Corporation in the United Kingdom. And we, in the training department, being fresh out of university, studying for my accounting, I studied under the computer department. Really? <laughs> and I mean, you know, and they just said, oh, where can we put all these trainees? Okay, let's put them under, you know, uh, the, 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 IT, the IT group. And so we were there. And so in all the budget work we were doing, we were, we were doing spreadsheets. I'm talking of, you know, many, many years ago, 40 years ago or so, uh, and was way ahead. So here, again, you look at it. So an economist, industrial, cost accountant with IT knowledge. You know, it was just the way, the, the way things work. And my first job when I left and I qualified was as a systems accountant. And when I came to Nigeria to work with Pfizer, it was to set up their computer department mm -hmm. back in 1970-something. <laughs> <laughs> set up their computer department. And um, so uh, when I finished that, I became the financial controller. So it, it's just, just, you know, this account, all these things were just coming together to sort of create a, a kind of a foundation of an individual that had this, this spread of knowledge. And, and so when it was time to set up uh, Philips Consulting, uh, and then don't forget also, that I ended up working with Cooper's and Librand uh -huh. in the UK. Um, and that's a consulting firm, uh, obviously. And we did all kinds of stuff, you know. Again, looking at the functional things we did, you know, in those days, we used to specify IT systems, we used to look at procedures, we could look at uh, even aspects of HR issues. Mm -hmm. Then after a while, they said, ah, Foley Show, they call me Foley. Hey, Foley, you, you know, teasing me. You're an African guy, we're gonna send you an African assignment. So guess what? I was into Ghana and out, into Nigeria, UAC and out, into Tanzania and out, into Kenya and out. You know, not South Africa in those days. But so, but one was going back and forth. So you look at it all. So when you end up setting up a Phillips Consulting, you, you look back and you say, look, uh, from a functional point of view, where I've been, and I said that, look, okay, Philips, you, we, we need to be a Pan-African company because I've worked at a Pan-African level. So all those things influenced uh, the kind of things that we done, that we did. Now, when we now look at our people, I realized very, very quickly that the bulk of the work I was doing at a point was going and marketing and selling. And, uh, you know, when you begin to get quite successful, you can't spread yourself out and be doing five, six, seven, eight, nine assignments. You learn very quickly that you've got to get people to do this. And, uh, and like I said, uh, this Peter Senge book got me really thinking about creating a learning organization. And so, like I said, we really invested a lot in, in books uh, in those days. I had a huge library and uh, the whole process, when you join the firm, there's a process you've got to go through. There's some basic things you've got to learn. There's some tools you've got to use. Um, and... Uh, and uh, a certain professor from, from Wits University in South Africa, uh, he had an impact. He, he, he called us together one day because he had come for a program. And he said, if anything should happen to FOP, mm. what's going to happen to this organization? He said, put it this way, if I want to sell this firm, what am I going to sell? Because, because if I sell this firm and, you know, you give, you know, or I buy this firm from you guys, and then on Monday morning, all of you walk out, what have I got? Is it the furniture? Is it the fancy paintings on the wall or what? What, what are you selling? And that raised the issue about building institutions. And uh, when he left, I went, went on a massive program of seeing how can we institu institutionalize the firm? Mm. So that when you buy the firm, what should happen is that consultants can come and go. The way we work is what we sell. 
okay and that's so important so we spend a lot of time procedures and manuals how to books how do you do surveys how do you do this how do you do that and we had all those things as manuals so that when consultants when they say they're going say okay bye bye uh, hi, hi there rose yeah. nice to meet you please become an expert read the manuals and today all those things are a lot easier because they're all digitized but that's the way we were passing on knowledge whether it became irrelevant who was here it was like do we have the body of knowledge that we can retain now it's available on the internet ai and stuff like that what is the discipline that you begin to look at and then begin to look at the character of people always recruit behavior not competence Oof. not only competence behavior because it's a character that wraps itself around your competence that defines the quality of your competence because you can be so good at something but bad behavior can just ruin it mm -hmm. You know, and and these things are so important that they begin to help. So when when we interviewed people in those days, you could never join the firm. And no matter how senior you are or how junior you are, you talk to literally everybody. You know, it was a boring process. You just go from one desk to another. Hi, how are you? What have you done? And by the time you finish that process, you have an idea of what the firm is about. Mm -hmm. Then the firm also has an idea of what this guy is coming in. And I always say, look, we've got to protect the door into our firm. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the character, I honestly don't care about your competence. We can teach you. In fact, you probably don't know what it is you're going to do from a work point of view. It's when you come in that you do my famous manuals that you learn. Mm -hmm. But what's your attitude? Who are you? And that's just helped to sustain. And when you don't maintain that over time, and we've wavered over time, depending on who's in charge and who's coming in, and 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 as you go higher, you get. Higher layer, more layers of managers and leaders and supervisors. They all have different attitudes and, and different ways, and you begin to challenge that. But that's really the theme. So I hope that has answered oh, your yes. question. Oh yes, fantastic! It's it's incredible. You said higher character, yeah, not competence, not competence uh, because behavior. competence can be thought, it can be learned. It can be learned. Where there is a yeah. solid character for that competence yeah. to sit on. And yes. let me just interrupt you. What about one of the things very important? When you say behavior, how do you know about somebody's behavior? Mm. We also got a tool. Okay. You know, we, we call it Thomas tool that we've used and we sort of believed in it so much in the sense that it actually helps, you know, it's like a psychometric type of thing. But it just, it does, it does help to identify uh, the kind of your behavioral traits, okay? You know, it doesn't tell whether you can you steal or not, anything like that, but just your behavioral traits. And, uh, you know, without going to think you can be a dynamic person or a very communicative person a very concise person a very uh, precise person mm -hmm. and those are very very strong traits that you can have but those things come to play when you create a team of people I need somebody to go and help me to set up a branch mm -hmm. when we're working with me. so if you're going to do that who's the project manager get the guy who's bum, 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 all the time mm -hmm. but I need uh, somebody to go to the branch because the branch is settled so you get your you get your, your, your quality person your your position serious person because you want to maintain that so behavior counts as well you got to understand people's character and behavior so when you look at these things at the beginning yes. you can say very easy, easily that this is the kind of person we want to pull in this is the kind of people that we need this leads to my, my my next question which is the fact that let's throw forward to the current um yeah, sure. the current dispensation a little bit i hear a lot of people in my generation talk about the fact that selling services in nigeria is hard mm. um you don't have a product that somebody can you know it's not tangible mm. and you've said so many things that you know touches or pokes that question a little bit is you've taken a service sector and you've yeah. changed yeah. the entire mm. type trajectory of how you deliver those services how are you able to make people see value in something that they cannot touch? No. Yeah. Because that's the typical question of a, an entrepreneur who is in the services sector. We mm. have challenges. I hear a lot of people talk about the fact that they always have issues because they're trying to, you know, underprice, overprice. Do you, did you face any of those oh, challenges at a point? Or uh, did and, you? And, and, and I discovered very, very quickly. Somebody, somebody have asked me before about um, uh, if there's one thing that I was, that, that was so pronounced in in the life of of the firm, or certainly in our getting uh, getting up and going. Uh, I said perception, mm. managing perception, and it's something that uh, you mustn't play with. And uh, there's a term that I use. I call it tangification mm. to, to 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 make things tangible. And we started off uh, in our tangification process 
um, by setting up an office, which at that time, uh, you know, nearly went broke or bankrupt in the process. But an office that you walked in and and you say, in fact, it's so funny, again, talking about Fola Adeola, I really can't, you know, <laughs> he, Fola came to talk to us in the office once. He talked, you know, we had people who were coming in and Fola Adeola uh, walked in and then when he was addressing us, he said, he said, when I walked into the reception, I said to myself, anybody coming for a consulting, trying to engage these consultants, you've got one or two choices. You can either look around, walk and uh, walk out and say, I can't afford these guys. Or say, yeah, this is the kind, this is the kind of people that I need yeah. because of the physical. We did set it up. It was a very, very nice office. But then again, we said that all our reports have got to be world class. Mm. Okay. Uh, the engagement with us has got to be world class. The service we provide, that's what the, you know, the world class. And, you know, consultants, you have a good teacher. Is that world class? Mm. So you're tangifying, you know, the content of a report by making the report look nice. And you're saying to the client that if I can go through this whole process of providing something that's actually beautiful, then begin to think a bit more about, about, uh, about what it is you can deliver. And this is the true story. Again, we, we had a breakfast meeting many years ago, it was at the Muzon. And the head of, at that time, the managing director of Now Merchant Bank, so, mm. you know, all these banks are dead now. And uh, he came and I was so amazed and so impressed to see him because I was, there, I was making my opening speech, yeah. etc. And after about 10, 15 minutes, he got up and he walked away. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, the a guy who was sort of the, the prime, the prime client, he sort of walked out. And I was a bit worried and we carried on. But later on in the day, he called. I said, Felicia, I came there. I said, yeah, I noticed you walked away. He said, oh, no, no, I'd seen what I wanted to see. He said, please, can you come and see me? And what did we do? We went around to see him that same day. And he said, you know, I walked in there and I just looked around. I just looked at what you guys have set up. It was a breakfast meeting. You we all going to have breakfast, give your presentations and talk your grammar. He said, but the little things. Mm -hmm. And he said, you won't believe what convinced me. He said, when I sat down at the table, you didn't have paper napkins. You had starch brocade napkins, you know. That was my caterer. But, you know, as far as he was concerned, he said, yeah, this is the kind of quality I want. Mm -hmm. Because he was going to engage us on a quality management mm -hmm. system for the bank. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that for, to a great extent, you have to try and see how you can tangify and create the feeling that what I will give you is of quality. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll say about this, you know, and this is something I joke about, is... Um, uh, somebody sort of half teased me and said, ah, Mr. Phillips, there you are, you know, with your bow tie and this and that, and uh, trying to look uh, uh, affluent mm -hmm. and whatever. And I said, it's very easy. There's no way I can come to you and tell you that I want to make you successful and I look like I need help as well. Mm. You know? True. And it's so important. So uh, you look at the guy who's talking to you say, well, he looks successful. He looks, he looks, he looks pretty good. So if he's going to guide me, into becoming successful, he certainly, he certainly must know about it. You know, is that the guy who says, I can make you win a million pounds with the pools and his shirt is torn and he's got, he said, go win the pools yourself first. Mm -hmm. And then, and then come to me and say, you know how to do it. So that's just to deal with it. And it's, it's serious because you might, you might sort of say to yourself, well, you know, what, what has that got to do with the fact that I, I'm selling an intangible service? It's the perception you create, the kind of confidence you give people about that, I, I believe that you can do it, okay? It's intangible, I don't know how else, but certainly from what I see and feel, mm -hmm. I'll, give you, I'll give you an opportunity. And that has worked tremendously for us over the Incredible. years. Incredible, thank you so much. You, you've, you've, you've clarified because it's not just about being good at what you do, but you must be seen, seen you must be perceived be seen. to be very good at what you do. You. It's, it's both sides of the coin and thank you, that's incredible. You talk about the African Renaissance a lot. I'm quite curious as to that, that and what it means to you, um, being Nigerian, being able to build a Pan-African entity, mm -hmm. something that's gone global right now, you know. Um, share with us a little bit about that. What's that about for someone, you know, just hearing that for the yeah, first well, time? Well, yes, well, yeah. I think that that was, you know, my travels in South Africa. And um, in the process, um, there's uh, the, we used to have. I, I joined joined up with a guy who had this uh, this magazine, uh, Finance Africa. Mm. That's the name of the magazine, Finance Africa, and you know, he did very well. The guy's late now, and um, we used to have this Finance Africa conference every year, and it became very very successful. Where we get, and don't forget, not 
nothing, not much was going on across Africa in terms of getting people to come to a particular location. I think it was South Africa that helped to make it happen because South Africa is such a, a, a wonderful place for conferences and stuff. And people were very interested in going into South Africa because it was a new country that had opened itself up uh, to the rest of Africa. And, and I got involved in a lot of this. And in the process of standing up and giving talks about leadership, giving talks about uh, then South Africa itself was going through its own changes. There's this NEPAD uh, new something for Africa development, then stuff with the African Union. So it was more of all these conferences, more of getting people to come together, more of getting Africans to come in and begin to see what's going on in different parts of the world. I had a conference once in which for some reason, uh, uh, the one of the speakers uh, was very, it was very rude about Nigeria mm. because as usual, Nigerians, we stormed the event. Okay. You look around, you know, there's maybe two, 300 people there <laughs> and about 200 of them are like Nigerians. And he was being funny and he thought it was being funny and sarcastic. Mm. And he was talking about Nigerians and he said, uh, you know, out of, uh, he, he, he was rude. Mm. So I got up and I said that, um, the gentleman that just spoke, I said, I want to apologize to all of you, okay, based on what he has said, I said, I want to apologize to South Africans all the effort we made to get you guys freed. I want to apologize to you about the amount of money that our parents had to give up from their mm. contribution to try and fund a lot of you. I want to apologize for having Tabo and Becky live in Sulere and uh, supported by people. I want to apologize for all the university places we granted. And I went on telling all the positive things that we had done. Mm. You know, the guy got up and said, I want to apologize to you, Mr. Phillips. Mm. So what I, I so it was a case of Africa opening up and Nigeria opening up because we, we used to go everywhere and just getting to getting to be a lot more aware of what is going on in the continent. So the African Renaissance for me was just a reawakening mm. by by Africans generally about the things that they need to do today. You know, things are going on with uh, with all these uh, things in Niger and the coups and all those negative things about stuff going on uh, against Africans, you find out that yeah, that renaissance was important and we need to sustain it. You know, it goes up and down. The African Union you know, is not doing enough, but that's a different story for another day. Story. But that's the background to that. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Uh, the, the fact that, you know, we live in a generation that really has to start thinking for the future because as much as we try, you know, it, we can't keep putting ourselves down. And I think mm. it's something that is incredible. That's such a leadership example, mm. you know, when everybody is tilting and saying the bad, you know, we look at the good things and then we, yeah. we emphasize on it. Mm. You know, we must keep branding ourselves and stating that as a nation, as a people, you know, we are telling our stories in the best possible, possible light. Way. We are not yeah. looking down on ourselves. And that's such a learning point for me. It Thank is. you for that incredible example. I definitely would have stood up and said, yes, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you sit as um, a chairman, as a board of so many companies, and you, you it's more or less, you are the father multitasking in a manner of speaking. Uh, how? do they relate with each other um in terms of corporate governance you are able to oversee you know the efficient running of different you're in banks mm. in financial organizations you're sitting on the board of flour mills you know a lot of interesting positions that you mm. occupy mm. um how do these positions interrelate with one another mm. and has there been any challenge have you how have you been able to navigate that mm. and in terms of even your mentoring endeavors as well because if these positions have some level of mentorship attached to them mm. in one way or the other. How do they interrelate? Yeah, you know, I think yeah. um, in, interesting question. You you find that when you to, today when you sit on huge boards, you know Flower Mills has about twenty five subsidiaries, yeah. huge 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 organization, and you you come to realize very quickly that you're depending on what the managers, what the executives are doing, hmm. and yours is just about governance. Uh, you're not there every day doing all the mundane things. You know, you, yours is just to look at really the top line and look at the philosophy to a certain extent, keep an eye on some key indicators, uh, make sure you're always exposed because when they misbehave, it's not about them, it's about the board, you know, and uh, make, make sure that there are things that you're watching to, to, uh, to protect the company, protect yourself as well. So um, the, the executive team is what you want to pay attention to. 
you know, with the banks, you know, like for example, I, I, I chair Standard Chartered Bank. Unfortunately, it's a bank that's got very, very tight risk management. Most of the banks do. So to a great extent, you as a board, you you know that you're sort of covered. And, you know, the regulator is very stiff. The central bank and uh, NDIC and all those guys, they're there on their backs every time and really making sure that they behave. But for me, it's 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 the global approach that you have. It's it's looking at things and talking about strategy at a, at a, at 45,000 mm. feet. So it's it's not as it's not as strenuous as you think. A lot of board papers to read and stuff like that. But that's just to, for you to ensure that everybody's behaving themselves. But it's not as tough as you think. In fact, it's almost like a recognition of what you, where you've been, what you've done, and uh, the the reliance and uh, comfort that other people feel, knowing that people like you are on the board. So you know, we, you know, you know, you're good. And some people are very strict. There's some boards that I'll say, I'm sorry not interested because of the people that are there and I'm saying that I'm not sure uh, I want to be uh, you know with them you know back to the thing about perception mm -hmm. it's such yeah. a critical factor yeah. for you thank yeah. you so much sitting as a consultant and to the entrepreneur listening to this conversation I just have a question which I'm pretty sure everyone will have in their hearts is what makes businesses work mm what makes businesses work with the wealth of experience you've had looking at the experiences as well the problems you've encountered the solutions you've provided what would you say makes businesses work um passion for a start hmm. and i say passion in terms of who's driving the business you know you have some businesses that are failing in quotes hmm. just depends on your definition of failure uh, and yet you find the person who is driving it is still very, very passionate about what it's doing. Um, there, there is no mad silver bullet of saying that all oh, this, that all the things. I can, I can begin to lecture you on strategy. I can begin to lecture you on systems. You lecture you on people, etc. But you know, you, you really, you really can't say. Um, mine is be passionate. Who is leading? Uh, is the person who leads? Is he walking the talk? Is he somebody that you? you can relate to, um, uh, are we working hard? Are we building institutions? Are we looking at processes and procedures? Uh, are we getting our people to be aligned? Do they understand what it is they have to do? Do they like the job? Are they suited for the work? Mm. Is their character, you know, the right one for what you do? Do they have the knowledge? And things of that nature. I think uh, those are they're very very broad, you know. To to begin to find one one That's one answer. That's a heavy question. Yes, it's, it's it's a bit difficult, you know. It's a bit difficult. But having said all that, I think I I, I want to turn on you. You know, you've been giving me a hard time and making me sweat here. But you know, be, before we started this program when we were chatting, yeah. um, I'd read your resume and I was sort of thinking of okay, what kind of what kind of conversation can I have with you, and. Uh, by the way, your resume doesn't do you justice based on what it is that I've discovered. You talk Thank a lot you. about you being a lawyer and the kind of things you, you do in the legal field. Mm -hmm. But what, what I find intriguing is um, the, this kind of mentoring I see you doing in the tech space. Okay, so tell me a bit about that very briefly. Wow, incredible. Thank you so much. So my journey uh, into tech started from the fact that I want to make a difference. Yes, we, as lawyers, we seem to be very traditional and cake. Mm. But um, summary was, I co-founded a legal tech company with a friend, and um, unfortunately, he passed on in mm. six months, barely after, and that left on me the responsibility and the passion that triggered for growth. And I found myself doing a lot of education. I spoke, talked about building businesses because not only was I teaching from a theoretical perspective but i was experiencing the art of even building something also and i was able to get into the world of technology um i started to develop myself do a lot of reading studying a lot just learning about the nuances and how tech companies have been read a lot of biographies you know learned a lot because like you said digital you know information yeah. is everywhere and i fell in love with corporate governance because one of the reasons I realized a lot of businesses failed was because there really was no institution, as you rightly said. Mm. You're not thinking beyond just 
let me raise my first fund mm. let me go mm. to market mm. let me have my most minimum viable product and launch 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 scale mm. scale mm. scale mm. nobody understands that to scale there must be something on which that scaling happens so that was that foundation and so I fell in love with that process, learning about risk management, everything that has to do that. The part that the founder may not necessarily be interested in, I fell in love with that part. Yeah. So I would always talk about it. I would write about it on LinkedIn. I organized events about it. I, For the past six months of this year, I was able to, so far so good, about 12 to 11 live events, live sessions, just talking about corporate governance and talking about a lot of things that business owners have to do. And I got a lot of people requests. Oh, I, I enjoy listening to you. Please, can you, you know, uh, talk to us? Some come in the capacity of, I'm a founder, I need guidance. Some come in, I want to learn. And I was able to do that. I had a couple of mentorship boot camps for people who were trying to grow in that aspect. Mm. It's just been a passionate and learning journey for me. I'm still learning, nowhere yeah, close sure. to where you are yeah. yet, you know, yeah. but it's been incredible just going through that experience and, you know, transferring that passion. I yeah. think that's that's that thing that just keeps you awake and you're like, I can do this for hours and I cannot get tired about it. Yeah. You know, yeah. that thing, it's just, yes, you just, you just don't stand, you stand in front of a place and you're just talking about how it's important to think legacy. Yeah, because passion, that's passion what is, it is sleeping three hours a day and feeling energetic when exactly. you wake up. Exactly. Okay. And and talking about that and picking picking up on on that uh, the what what you know and the mentor mentorship and mentoring is something that I that uh, uh, a lot of people come to me and say you know I want you to be my mentor I want you to be my mentor. But in your own experience, yeah. how how best can one truly mentor? And mm. this is a question I'm asking because I get inundated with ah oh, Mr. Felice I want you to be my mentor. And I say yeah fine but. What do I do? What, you know. So, what 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 would your generation require mm. in terms of mentoring? Honestly, it's such an incredible question because I recently uh, became a so th there's a program um, Google does they um, train women tech makers uh, for the Google Black Founders Fund and I became recently appointed as a mentor under this year this year's court and it was literally a teaching about what does mentorship actually entail mm -hmm. and I learned two things is number one the goal of a mentor is not to transform the mentee to become like them. Mm -hmm it's to transform them to become the better version of themselves. So you're helping them carve a path. You may ideate with them, you may brainstorm with them, but your job is not to convert them to mm -hmm. you. It's to make them see that there is a new level of themselves. So guiding them in that path. So I think the greatest, to answer that question directly is, what we would need from your generation definitely is just that guidance. These were mistakes we made. You don't have to, you don't, you don't necessarily have mm -hmm. to. The feedback I even got for myself is try not to be too directive. I don't know what that means, right? Don't say do A, do B, do B. Understand the context. Mm. And then let them see the reason why it's important for them to go that route without necessarily forcing it. Because mentorship is more as I do you follow not necessarily not just as i instruct it yeah. may be a combination of both mm -hmm. but understanding that so i think our generation really needs a lot of modeling and beyond the modeling the mentorship in terms of i've walked this path these were the mistakes i made this is why i made those mistakes we don't get to hear a lot of failure stories we hear a lot of success stories mm -hmm. we don't yeah, hear a yeah, lot of yeah. struggle yeah, and exactly. sometimes we feel lost because mm -hmm. you're like these guys have never made mistakes in their <laughs> lives before where do i start so i have a small challenge I'm, I'm already running up and down. But when I'm able to relate with the struggle of someone I'm looking up to, it, it, yeah, it makes me know that there's yeah, hope. Sure. And I think that's the best example that a mentor can give yeah. to his mentor. Yeah, I think it's just brilliant just knowing that, you know, you, you, people like you do mentoring and it's not all these like us that are supposed to do. So, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Thank that's you fine. so much. So, once again, I want to say thank you for tuning in. We've come to the end of this episode of the Journeys in Entrepreneurship by K Foundation. Please look out for replays of this session. I'm excited. And thank you so much, Mr. Phillips, for being here. It's such an incredible honor and privilege having you. Believe thank me, you. I learned a lot from you too, honestly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for watching this episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. This interview was recorded on the 8th of September, 2023 at Faith Foundation's office in Lagos. We look forward to hearing about your aha moments in the comment section below. And watch out for the next episode.